you have a favorite gospel hymn? Well, I do. My wife says, I think, husband, uh, every day you have a new favorite gospel hymn. But I think the Apostle Paul might have really liked this one, a song by Gabriel, uh, uh, Charles H. Gabriel, titled, Send the Light. The Apostle Paul's, maybe one of his favorite songs, had he, was he able to hear it. Notice the words, there's a call comes ringing or the restless way, send the light, send the light. There are souls to rescue, there are souls to save, send the light, send the light. Notice the second stanzas. We have heard, Paul did, the Macedonian call today, send the light, send the light, and a golden offering at the cross we lay. The last stanza, let us not grow weary, and Paul certainly did, in the work of love, send the light, send the light, let us gather jewels for a crown above, send the light, send the light. Well, we've looked at Paul's first missionary journey, his second missionary journey, and now his third missionary journey. And the first stop was Asia Minor, and Paul revisits those churches to exhort them and instruct them. Many of these churches he had founded on his first and second missionary journeys. Then his second stop was the city of Ephesus. But before he arrived, we read there was a certain Jew named Apollos, born at Alexandria, an eloquent man and mighty in the scriptures, came to Ephesus. And this man was instructed in the way of the Lord. And being fervent in spirit, he spake and taught diligently the things of the Lord, knowing only the baptism of John. In other words, he was just a freshman in Bible college. He didn't know the whole story. Well, uh, thank God there were two people, a couple that heard him, Aquila and Priscilla good friends of Paul in the city, and he began to speak boldly in the synagogue, whom when, this couple, Aquila and Priscilla had heard, they took him unto them, now notice, and expounded unto him the way of God more perfectly. And that's hopefully why you're enrolled in this Bible Institute, that you might learn and then expound to others the way of God more perfectly. Well, after this, he leaves, and Paul arrives, and Paul finds 12 disciples of John the Baptist who knew only of the ministry of Christ and nothing of Pentecost. They were sort of, I guess, like second semester uh, freshmen, but they didn't know the whole story either. So he brings them up to date. Uh, when they heard this, they were baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus, and when Paul has laid his hands upon them, the Holy Ghost came on them, and they spake with tongues and were prophesied, uh, or prophesied. And then later, these 12 are baptized. Now, this is the final of three instances in Acts in which individuals spoke in tongues, and it, ma it marks the last of nine occasions on which individuals were baptized in the book of Acts. Have you been baptized since you've been saved? Well, where we won't even discuss or argue the mode of baptism, but the institution of baptism is very scriptural. Well, we read that Paul went into the synagogue there in Ephesus and spake boldly for the space of three months. And this continued by the space of two years, he stretched it out. The first 90 days went well, so he continued, so that all they which dwelt in Asia heard the word of the Lord Jesus, both Jews and Greeks. And uh, it was a, uh, just an amazing time for Paul. God wrought special miracles by the hands of Paul, so that from his body were brought unto the sick handkerchiefs or aprons and the diseases departed from them, and the evil spirits went out of them. Interesting, uh, sort of a humorous event here. There was, uh, Paul wasn't on hand one time, a poor guy, some poor guy was demon-possessed, and so uh, some of the vagabond Jews, a fellow by the name of Sceva, and his, uh, he had some sons, and uh, I guess they were uh, sort of uh, hucksters, and they said, hey, you don't need Paul to cast out an evil spirit. We can do that, maybe for a little money. So they, uh, they tried to do exactly what Paul, they'd seen Paul do. <laughs> but the evil spirit answered and said, Jesus I know, and Paul I know, but who are ye? I don't know you guys. Well, and the man in whom the evil spirit was leaped on them, overcame them, 
and prevailed against them so that they fled out of the house naked and wounded. So before you try to rebuke Satan, you better make sure that you're prayed up and paid up. Well, this is the final of at least, this is in Acts 19, 11 New Testament instances of demon-possessed individuals. And you see that in your notes, and you may want to go through that. That's on page 51 and 52. Now, but we continue our account in Ephesus. Many believed that belief came and confessed and showed their deeds. Many of them also who used curious arts, that means they were involved in the occult, brought their books together and burned them before all men. Well, an anti-Paul meeting is conducted by Demetrius, a silversmith who had profited by making silver shrines for the goddess Diana. And uh, the long and short is he uh, tried to uh, institute a kangaroo court trial to kill Paul, but it didn't work. And uh, the Lord stepped in and spoke through the mouth of the town clerk who tried to and finally was able to bring some sort of semblance and, and to send the troublemakers home. So um, after that, then Paul leaves his third stop, Greece, and here he stays three months. And then he leaves to escape a plot of the Jews to kill him. And his fourth stop is Troas. And something very important happens at Troas. We read, And upon the first day of the week, this would be Sunday, when the disciples came together to break bread, Paul preached unto them, ready to depart on the morrow, and continued his speech until midnight. Can you imagine modern-day Christians. My soul, the service is starting at 7, supposed to end at 8, and here it is, 8, 18, and the preacher's still going. Well, Paul went on until midnight. And we read, And there sat in the window a certain young man named Eutychus, being fallen into a deep sleep. Now, I want to be fair to Eutychus. The Greek here indicates he was a coma. In other words, he just wasn't sacking out. He, uh, he had a real problem. And as Paul was long preaching, he sunk down with sleep and fell down from the third loft and was taken up bed, probably broke uh, dead, probably broke his neck. And Paul went down and fell on him and embracing him said, Trouble not yourselves, for his life is in him. He raises them from the dead. And they brought the young man alive and were not a little comforted. In other words, there's great joy. And this is an important, not only because of the resurrection of a human being, but it, this marks, Acts 20, the final of eight resurrections in the Bible. It doesn't count the resurrection of Jesus because, of course, uh, Jesus... Uh, uh, when he was resurrected, he didn't die again, but all these other did. So there were three in the Old Testament and three in the New Testament and, and two in the book of Acts. Now you have uh, faith healers today. I can mention a few I won't. One says he's raised at least 12 from the dead. I simply do not believe that. I think eight individuals have been raised from the dead in the history of mankind. This was the last one in Troas about 2,000 years ago by the Apostle Paul. The fifth stop on his third missionary journey was Miletus. And from Miletus he, went, he sent to Ephesus and called the elders of the church. Uh, he, uh, he had a sort of a layover there as you have in Atlanta. Someone said at the, at the rapture there will be a two-hour layover in Atlanta if you're flying, but, well, he was sailing, and so there was probably a several-day layover there at Ephesus, uh, at Miletus, rather, and so he sent to Ephesus and brought a messenger and brought back some, uh, some uh, deacons there and preachers, and he preached to them. And he says, therefore, we can just watch this, we can just uh, see in our eyes, uh, mind's eye, this uh, little meeting of uh, some dedicated men on the beach, and Paul is there, and he's preaching. He said, therefore, watch and remember that by the space of three years, I cease not to warn everyone day and night with tears, serving the Lord with all humility of mind, and with many tears and temptations, which befell me by the lying in wait of the Jews." And how I kept back nothing that was profitable unto you, but I've showed you and I've taught you publicly and from house to house, for I have not shown to declare unto you all the counsel of God. 
testifying both to the Jews and also to the Greeks, repentance toward God and faith toward our Lord Jesus Christ. And what a testimony now. What a statement. Wherefore, I take unto you record this day that I am pure from the blood of all men. I have coveted no man's silver, nor gold, nor apparel. Yea, ye yourselves know that these hands have ministered unto my necessities and to them that were with me. I have showed you all things, how that so laboring ye ought to support the weak and to remember the words of the Lord Jesus, how he said... It is more blessed to give than receive. Now, notice my uh, outline, my note here. This statement, it is more blessed to give than to receive, is not found in the four gospel accounts. But apparently, Jesus had said it so often, it was so well known, that uh, the Apostle Paul could quote it here. It is more blessed to give than it is to receive. And he concludes, And now, behold, I go bound in the Spirit into Jerusalem, not knowing the things that shall befall me, save that the Holy Ghost witnesses in every city, saying that bonds and afflictions abide me. And now, behold, I know that ye all among whom I have gone preaching the kingdom of God shall see my face no more. So take heed, therefore, unto yourselves, to all the flock over which the Holy Ghost hath made you overseers to feed the church of God, which he hath purchased with his own blood. And now, brethren, he finishes, I commend you to God and to the word of his grace, which is able to build you up and give you an inheritance among all them which are sanctified. I remember my ordination uh, nearly 50 years ago, 45 years ago, an old Baptist preacher long since with the Lord, uh, Pastor Earl Jones, said uh, as he preached the sermon to the candidate, the challenge to the candidate, he said, Brother Harold, I can give you no better advice as a young minister than you read prayerfully and carefully at least, at least once a week, Acts chapter 20. Well, I've read it many times. To my shame, I haven't read it every week. But to every Christian, especially every Christian leader, desiring God's best for their life, I would commend them to the word of his grace and also the admonition to read Acts 20 at least once a week. Well, he then leaves, and his sixth stop, the city of Tyre. And finding disciples, we tarried there seven days who said to Paul through the Spirit that he should not go up to Jerusalem. Now, it would seem that the apostle here missed God's will. He had already been warned during the beginning of his ministry by the Lord to make haste, get thee quickly out of Jerusalem, for they will not receive thy testimony concerning me. Well, Paul's motive for going to Jerusalem, even though uh, apparently God and then through his servants that said don't go at this time seemed to have been his great love for his people at any rate he did go of course it is very significant that his Jerusalem stop final trip to Jerusalem even though brief is one of the very few at which absolutely no fruit is recorded yes I think the great apostle got out of the will of God at this time his seventh stop, a place called Ptolemus. And when we had finished our course from Tyre, we came to Ptolemus and saluted, saluted our brethren and abode for them one day. The eighth stop was Caesarea on the coastline there, the Mediterranean. And the next day, we were, and Luke says we because Luke was with him, of Paul's company departed and came into Caesarea and we entered into the house of Philip the Evangelist. We haven't seen this guy, remember, since uh, the days of the uh, Ethiopian eunuch, which was one of the seven original deacons, and abode with him. And the same man had four daughters, virgins, which did prophesy. Now these young women are the last mentioned in the Bible who had this gift. And Miriam, you remember, had it, and Deborah, Isaiah's wife, Huldah, and Anna, these young women. Well, as we tarried among them many days, there came down from Judea a certain prophet named Agabus. Now, he knew Paul, and he was at uh, Antioch with Paul many years ago. 
And when he had thus come to us, he took Paul's girdle and bound his own hands and feet, said, This is what's going to happen to you if you go to Jerusalem. So Agabus, the other prophets, got himself and said, Don't go, don't go, don't go. But Paul said, I can't help it, I'm going. What mean ye to weep and to break mine heart? For I'm going. I am ready to be bound, not only bound also, Agabus, as you say will happen, but also to die at Jerusalem for the name of the Lord Jesus. And we read, and when he would not be persuaded, we cease saying, the will of the Lord be done. So the we there indicates that Luke himself, the beloved physician who was with Paul, said, please don't go. Well, number eight, the final trip visit to Jerusalem by Paul. And he meets there, John, he meets there the pastor of the church of Jerusalem, a fellow by the name of James, not the apostle James, but uh, the half-brother of Jesus and also the author of the book of James. And James informs Paul that many Jews were saying bad things about him. He says, Paul, I, here's what they're saying. They are informed of thee, wrongly so, but that thou teachest that all the Jews which are among the Gentiles, you teach them to forsake Moses. They, he didn't do that at all. Saying that they ought not to circumcise their children, neither to walk after the customs of the law. Paul did not do that. He did make a case that saved Gentiles didn't have to be circumcised, but they're slandering him now. And uh, also that he had desecrated the temple of God. And he did not, he had not said that either. Well, to counteract these false rumors, Paul agrees to put himself back under the law, shaves his head, and takes a seven-day vow. So I think he is out of the will of God and going to the city of Jerusalem, and he's compromising now because uh, uh, he had already written, Christ is the end of the law. To, uh, oh, cursed be those who continue in the law. Book of Romans, the book of Galatians. But now, in, a, in an attempt, a sincere attempt, but I think an unwise attempt, he compromises his testimony, puts himself back under the law. Well, um, he was uh, soon surrounded by a Jewish mob uh, in the temple, and they were going to tear him apart. And uh, he was rescued at the last minute by the Romans and he was allowed to speak. And so here, uh, there's a number of Jewish leaders, and they're very sullen and angry, but he quiets and he begins to speak. And he says, And it came to pass that as I made my journey, gives his testimony, and was come nigh unto Damascus about noon, suddenly there shone from heaven a great light round about me, and I fell to the ground and heard a voice saying unto me, Saul, Saul, why persecutest thou me? And I answered, Who art thou, Lord? And he said unto me, I am Jesus of Nazareth, whom thou persecutest. And I said, What shall I do, Lord? And the Lord said, Arise and go to Damascus, and there it shall be told of thee of all things which are appointed for thee to do. And he continues on, but when he makes this statement, all uh, hell breaks loose. And he said, God said to me, Depart, for I will send thee far hence unto the Gentiles. Gentiles. Well, we read, and they gave him audience, they listened to him, until this word, they hated the Gentiles, and then lifted up their voices and said, Away with such a fellow from the earth, for it is not fit that he should live. And again, <laughs> they try to tear him apart, and he is rescued by the Romans. And following this then, he is taken to Caesarea. But right before it, we read, the night following, the Lord stood by him right before he left the city of Jerusalem and said, Be of good cheer, Paul, for as thou hast testified of me in Jerusalem, so must thou also bear witness to me at Rome. So even though you may have been out of my will, I know your heart was right, and I'm going to forgive you, but you will. You've always wanted to go to Rome. You'll be able to go to Rome. And then that night, Paul is removed. The captain of the band of soldiers said, Make ready 200 soldiers to go to Caesarea, and horsemen three score and ten, and spearmen 200 at the third hour of the night, and to provide them beasts that they may set Paul upon, and bring them safe unto Felix the governor. 
And, of course, you know, while in Caesarea, he was there two years, and he had the chance to witness to a governor and to a king. And uh, the governor, of course, was Felix. And uh, Felix uh, was a, uh, uh, well, he was a money grabber and a crooked, corrupt politician. And uh, he tried to get uh, money out of Paul. If you'll bribe me, maybe I can release you. But uh, certain days when Felix came with his wife, Drusilla, uh, he set them before Paul and uh, heard him concerning the faith in Christ. So he came really to get money, but Paul preached unto him, and we read this. And as Paul reasoned of righteousness, temperance, and judgment to come, Felix trembled and answered, Go thy way for this time. When I have a more convenient season, I will call for thee. And then he's still in jail. And after this, we read, in certain day, After certain days, King Agrippa and Bernice came to the Caesarea to salute and to speak with the governor. And while he was there and his wife, uh, he said, you know, I've heard about this political prisoner, Paul. I'd like to hear him. And so Paul is brought in, and he preaches to the king. Whereupon, as I went to Damascus with authority and commission from the chief priest at midnight, O king, midday, O king, I saw in the way a light from heaven above the brightness of the sun shining round about me. And whereupon, he concludes, O king, I was not disobedient unto the heavenly vision. Well, uh, then he talks directly to King Agrippa. He says, King Agrippa, all this, uh, the crucifixion of Christ and my sorrows, it wasn't done in a corner. You've heard about it. Do you believe the prophets? Now, Agrippa had a Jewish background. I know that you believe the prophets. Then Agrippa said unto Paul, <laughs> Almost thou persuadest me to be a Christian? Now, think of those two words, uh, reactions, one by uh, the governor, Felix, and the other by the king. And I think um, the songwriter, uh, Paul Bliss, had this in mind when he combined these two reactions in his song, Almost Persuaded, Now to Believe, Almost Persuaded, Christ to Receive. Seems now some soul to say, Go, Spirit, go thy way, some more convenient day. On the, I call, on the I'll call. Almost persuaded, come, come today. Almost persuaded, turn not away. Jesus invites you here. Angels are lingering near. Prayers rise from hearts so dear. Oh, wonder, come. And then the last stanza, so sad. Almost persuaded, harvest is past. Almost persuaded, doom comes at last. Almost cannot avail. Almost is but to fail. Sad, sad, that bitter wail. Almost, but lost. And well, that brings us uh, to number 10, the voyage of Paul to Rome. And you know that uh, in routing it was a terrible storm, and uh, everybody thought they were going to die. But Paul then appears uh, on the deck of this sinking ship, and he said, I exhort you to be of good cheer. For there stood by me this night the angel of God, whose I am and whom I serve, saying, Fear not, Paul, thou must be brought to Caesar, and lo, God hath given thee all them that sail with thee. Wherefore, sirs, to these frightened passengers, be of good cheer, for I believe God, that it shall be even as it was told me. And so the long and short is all 276 passengers escape and uh, to the Isle of Melita. And there, of course, uh, there are two miracles that happen. A snake bites Paul, and he survives. And then Paul has the privilege of healing the dying father of the governor of the island. And finally, Paul reaches the city of Rome, where he will spend the next two years before his release. I think, again, one of his favorite songs might have been, had he known today, uh, William J. Pa Kilpatrick's great, great song, We have heard the joyful sound, Jesus saves, Jesus saves, spread the tidings all around. Paul was doing that. Jesus saves, Jesus saves, bear the news to every land, climb the steeps and cross the waves, onward 
Student, onward, tis our Lord's command. Jesus saves. Jesus saves. <laughs>